every day, every founder, focus on your people over profit. Um, because if you do that, the profit will follow and it does not work in reverse. Welcome to the Agency Profit Podcast, a show dedicated to going deep space Space. on agency operations, which is just as nerdy as it sounds. I'm your host, Marcel Petipoff. I'm the CEO of Parakeeto, a firm that helps digital and creative agencies measure and improve their profitability. Join me as I interview some of the smartest thought leaders and agency owners in our space and go deep into operations, metrics, and all the other things you need to get right so you can spend less time worrying about operations and more time executing on your vision. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Agency Profit Podcast. I'm joined today by a very special guest, the president at Blast Media, which was recently named by Adage as one of the top places to work in 2022, and doing so at scale, 65, 70 people on the team. Uh, We also have now spun businesses out of, when I say we, I mean they, have also spun businesses out of this, like StatWax, Um, and we're here today to talk about employee staying power, employee churn, and some of the innovative things that they're doing to create great culture and keep their employees happy. So with all of that, Lindsay Groper, thank you for joining us today. Hey, Marcel, thank you. I'm excited to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, I appreciate you making some time for us. I think this is a topic that is topical for a lot of people that uh, might have experienced a lot of turnover in the last year or two with all the turbulence that we've seen in the employee market, uh, recessions looming, the boom and bust of our industry. Um, First, before we get into any of this, I want to start with really kind of setting the frame on today's conversation. What is employee churn? What is employee turnover? And what symptoms do uh, people feel when they might be experiencing a problem around this? Yeah. I mean, everybody probably defines employee engagement differently. Um, My take on it is how do people feel about coming to work with you every day? Um, How do they feel on Sunday nights when they're facing down a new work week? Uh, Are they, do they have the Sunday scaries? Are they dreading speaking with their coworkers? Are they avoiding coming in the office? Uh, These are are all ways that people feel about the place that they work. So for me, it's all about feeling. Um, And how do you ensure that it is a place that feels safe for people to show up as they choose to show up as their authentic self? Um, Are they fulfilled in the work that they're doing? And do they enjoy the people that they do it with? Um, So that's something that's been a a focus of ours from day one. I mean, we've been around for 17 years. So even this last, uh, call it eight months of craziness um, in the U.S., we've gone through a couple of recessions. We've weathered the storm. So this isn't the first time our agency has seen this. Um, But from the start, it's always been about creating a place that people like the work they do and the people they do it with. And that's been really our North Star for the last 17 plus years. I love that qualification of how people feel at work, because I think we try to chalk employee churn and culture down to these very objective measures, right? Are people working more or less hours than what's in their contract? And, you know, like how much time do we spend in meetings and how many foosball tournaments do we have throughout the year? And like these things that are measurable. But in my experience, the context of work is much more important than the volume. And I know this in my personal life when I'm spending time on things that make me feel like I have to show up in a way that's out of alignment or have to put on, you know, a face or I have to perform or I'm around a group of people that I don't really gel with, that context can be much more draining than the volume of time that I spend working. And that I think is a really, really, really key component. So let's talk a little bit about, um, first of all, what are some of the things that you have learned over 17 years? It's a long time about employee churn. What are some of the symptoms that maybe you struggled with and what's led you to the frameworks that you've installed today that are obviously um, paying dividends? Yeah. Uh, every business will have their own telltale sign. So I, I will speak to ours. But uh, for us, when you, you know, when a new employee, new team member starts, they have a, a certain energy about them. You're excited to have them and they're excited to be there. It's day one, right? Um, and what we typically, when, when our, our spider senses start to tangle, of like something is not right, is when we start to see the, that light go out in that person. 
And so that shows up in different ways. Um, sometimes it's very subtle ways where they aren't participating in meetings. They're not showing up for more of the social events. There seems to be an apathy about their work. Um, it, you can almost sense like this energy shift with people. And usually when we sense that, we know that there's something off um, and we'll have the conversation. And usually um, we're right about that. Usually that feeling is right. And sometimes we can fix it and sometimes we can't. If it boils down to, I just don't like the work, if there's not really any other opportunities to plug in in a different role, I mean, we do one thing, we do, we do PR for B2B SaaS companies. So if inherently you don't like the work, we can't change what we do and that's okay. It's probably time to move on. We'll find a different role. Um, but other times it has to do with just diving in and figuring out um, what can re-energize this person, reconnect them maybe with their, their team or the, you know, the fulfillment with their work. Uh, but it usually, if you feel it, there, you, there is science behind your gut feeling. It's usually right. Mm. And this sounds a lot like the thing that um, I'm hearing a lot about on social media that is being labeled as quiet quitting. What you've just described is very akin to what I'm hearing as being described as quiet quitting, the sense of like somebody has basically decided to um, just kind of throttle the amount of investment that they make in their career. Um, and there's a lot of debate right now about, is that just people setting healthy boundaries? Is this people actually like becoming apathetic about their work? And of course, that's a somewhat of a gray area and it's hard to draw the lines on that without context. But yeah. I think this, I, the, this insight of when you see it happening, when to instigate the conversation is a good one. So with that said, what are some of the things that you found to be effective in either preventing these kinds of situations or reversing them when you see them happening? Yeah. Number one, it's realizing that the reason I find joy in work is different than the reason someone else finds joy in work. So it's almost like if you think, if you ever read, have you ever read the Love Languages book or heard about the Love Languages? Yes. Yeah. So uh, that is as it relates to feeling loved, right? So I, I'm relating it to that. Um, not that we're in romantic relationships, but uh, it is also to sort of your, your how, how you like to work. Um, so if what brings me joy is the people, I can't just build a culture around being near people and getting together socially all the time because that might not be what resonates with the, with the other person. So we do a number of things before someone is even brought on board as a team member. Um, number one is everybody does a culture index survey. Um, it is called CI, um, Culture Index, and it gives us insight into what makes these people tick. Um, what, how are they with detail, with collaboration? Do they prefer to work independently or do they make decisions logically versus emotionally? Um, so it helps to us to understand fundamentally who our team members are and be able to interact with them and create opportunities for them accordingly. Um, but then we also provide a number of different opportunities for people to fill their cup in different ways. So again, our work is our work. Um, I wish we were doing something incredible, you know, incredible and meaningful and, you know, creating habitats for whales that are, um, you know, that are fading from this world, but we're not. We're doing PR for B2B SaaS companies. Um, everyone has to find fulfillment in their own ways and we have to create those opportunities. So we have a number of different ways to plug into our uh, agency, whether that is through our volunteer committee, DEI committee, we have a social, um, we have a recruiting committee, those that like to go out uh, and recruit and talk about their experience with Blast Media. And then we also are forming ERGs. So for those who can find a, a bit more deeper meaning with the people that they work with who are like them um, and have shared opinions and shared experiences, it's really important that we develop ways for people to, to fill their cups outside of just the work that they do here. So that's uh, definitely one way. Uh, and then the other thing, too, is we scaled really quickly. Uh, in from 2020 to 2021, we doubled our headcount. Um, so call it from, from 30 to 60. Uh, that was new for us. Uh, we grew very fast. We had a lot of new people. And what we realized was that we weren't giving them the training that they needed. So when you're 30 people you're really able to have that institutional knowledge be transferred easier because your people have been here the longest are really still working on accounts. Um, they are day to day in the weeds. And as we scaled, right, you start to have those layers build up. And what we realized is that inherent institutional knowledge that had made us successful wasn't getting passed down. 
So we developed a, a brand new training program. It's called an accelerator program. Um, we promoted a director of learning and development um, to run this program and develop it for us. And we basically developed cohorts of uh, whatever, insert titles, but similar titles of people who had um, similar roles. And they go through a nine month cohort. And it's everything from yes, on the job skills training, but also if you're newer to the workforce, it is things like calendar management and time blocking, having tough conversations. Um, and we have found that program to really help level our people up and make them feel like we're investing in them as individuals um, versus doing blanket training or no or not training them at all. It's amazing. And it's funny, I spoke to another founder that was at a stage of growth where they kind of described it as saying, I don't want to grow because I want the company to get bigger. Like uh, that's not really a thing anymore. It's right. about giving my people the opportunity to have somewhere to go. Cause if it's not here, then they're going to have to find it somewhere else. Um, I agree with that person. Yeah. And, it, <laughs> and it's interesting because when they told me this, they were almost exactly the same stage of growth that you were at. And so it was very rewarding for them to be able to take these people that they probably would have lost within the next 12 to 24 months, because clearly they were standouts that had a lot of potential and they would have found that upside somewhere else had they not been able to reach that next level and create that next layer of positions and opportunities for those folks to stick around and continue right. to contribute. So very, very cool that you were able to create that. Um, so that's obviously an important thing in retention as well that doesn't often get talked about, which is uh, at some point people need to progress in their careers and there's only so much investing in them in terms of training and development that you can do until the pay scale, the salary, the responsibility has to come out uh, and that ceiling needs to get raised. And I love your concept of kind of pushing people before they're ready. How do you, what's your thought process behind how you figure out those opportunities and, and and get people into that role before they're necessarily pushing for the promotion. Cause yeah. that, I think that's how most people are typically handling this. It's a reactive sure. thing. And it's pushing them before they think they're ready, right? We usually know that they're ready. Um, and uh, one of the easiest ways to see that is through, uh, we use a HR tech platform um, for all, for quarterly reviews. So they do a peer assessment. Um, there's peer assessment, self-assessment, manager assessment. And usually you can see the, the feedback all aligns that that isn't just, you know, feel a feeling that we have about this person. It is the, you know, that sort of the more of the obvious results stuff you can see. But then between that self peer and manager assessment is you're saying, OK, the this feedback is all aligning that their manager thinks that they're ready and awesome. The people that they work with, like the, on their team, are championing this person, uh, and you can see that they, you know, there's a lot of self awareness on the self assessment of where what are they most proud of, and then what are the areas where they still need work. Um, when there's that level of self awareness, then too, usually those align, and then we know, okay, they might not think they're quite there yet, but literally everyone else does, <laughs> so it's time. Uh, so having that data that you can use is critical um, because it backs up it backs up more of that feeling of it with uh, real feedback from the, the the entire spectrum of those that you work together with, your manager and yourself. Hey, it's Marcel here, and I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. If you are, then I want to encourage you to check out the Agency Profitability Toolkit. It's a free set of resources that we've put together to help agency owners just like you improve their profitability. It's full of free checklists, templates, and training videos, and has helped thousands of agencies get better at measuring the essentials of their business. So if you want to grab a free copy of that, you can head to paraquito.com forward slash toolkit or look for a link wherever you're watching or listening to this. With that, I want to thank you again for tuning in, and I'll let you get back to the episode. Hmm. So I'm seeing that there's like an art and a science to this that are, it's coming together for me. The right. art of it is, you know, it's kind of more of the, the strategy, the meaning, um, being able to tie people's individual goals and where they find, um, you know, fulfillment from back to things that are happening in the company. But the science part of this, which I love is that there's a process here. There's a process mm -hmm. for finding that stuff out when they come in. There's a process for getting them trained and invested in. There's a process for identifying, you know, the, like doing the quarterly assessments, collecting the feedback, figuring out what lane they fit into. I would love to, understand at a high level what the framework is. And I think in leading up to today's recording, we had talked about these three concepts of trust, uh, technology, and transparency. Could you walk me through like at the high level, the framework that this stuff all kind of ties into? Yeah. 
We've talked a, a little bit about um, about the the trust factor, but you know, I'll, I'll take us back. And I, it seems so long ago. Um, let's take us back to March of 2020. Um, so much has happened, uh, and you take us to today, and then even just the the just such the quick swing of great resignation, recession. Who holds the power? There's just been so much that has happened, um, and. You know, throughout it all, all these changes, we really found that the key to retention has come. These three things, these three T's, the trust, transparency, and technology have really helped. Um, you know, trust is is paramount. It's first and foremost is, uh, and this goes back to the quiet quitting you were talking about. We truly, if you're, you know, showing up for the stuff you need to show up for, right? Showing up for your clients, showing up for your team, and you're getting your work done. It, we don't. It really doesn't matter the hour. You know how many hours that you're working, or if you, you know, were working from home on a day and it was gorgeous out, and you went to a park for two hours. If you're a high performer and getting your work done and showing up for the people that need you, you can do that in a capacity that works for you. Uh, we are in a services business. Agencies are. We do have clients, so it, this isn't just a you know work on your own time from you know midnight to twelve, you know to twelve noon. You know, we do have to show up for our teams and our clients, um, but we have to trust our people that they're doing that in a way that works for them. And so we we don't necessarily like police that time or um, or assume the worst, right? We don't assume that people aren't productive. We don't assume that people are taking advantage of the time and the flexibility. Um, we trust that they are working in a way that works for them in a way that works for us. Um, transparency is something that's really been a consistent for us. Um, you talk about you know, the start of COVID until now. Um, and the transparency comes in exposing your entire agency to the realities of the business. Now, this doesn't mean showing the P&L and walking through that line by line. And um, you know, we're not transparent on salaries. But in terms of the performance of the business, we are transparent. So when we have our quarterly staff meetings and our monthly staff meetings, we're talking about how does our margin sit? How many clients have we lost? How many clients have we gained? We're talking about overall agency health. And even during COVID, literally we had a Slack channel that was clients coming, clients leaving, um, what we're doing to, you know, to weather this storm. And our, our, when you're able to do that and be transparent enough in a way that you're comfortable, every owner is going to be comfortable sharing different numbers um, and different metrics. But what, what we have always found that that breeds is this sense of togetherness where even with COVID, Everybody's panicking, right? New, nobody knew it was happening. Uh, but rather than us all being in the same lifeboat and someone's hoarding the rations and the other person's stealing the oars and the other person's taking all the water, is we were all in the same lifeboat trying to keep each other afloat. So we're helping the person that is struggling and maybe needs my water and we are, you know, sharing the food and we're all working together. There was all this sudden, it's like, yeah, this is scary. And, you know, even this year, right, there's been craziness happening. This is a scary time, but at least we have an understanding of how we're functioning as an agency and we're going to work it out together. It might be hard together, but we're going to weather the hard together, just like we celebrate the good stuff together. Um, and I was so proud of our team for that. And I do believe it was through the transparency of this is what's happening and these are why certain decisions are being made. Um, and then also being transparent when the decisions that you make don't work out. Um, not every decision that we execute is the right one. And we're the first one to say, hey, guys, thanks for rolling with that one. We're going to change it up again. Here's why. Wasn't the right call. Um, and then the last one is, is on the technology front is we have the benefit of being the size that we are to have budget to invest in technology. We work with B2B SaaS companies. We invest in software that um, really helps our teams spend less time on mundane tasks or less time on repetitive tasks. And instead they're able to, sorry, instead they're able to focus on uh, work that matters. So we've been able to automate a lot of our processes, our reporting, um, use dashboards so that our clients can access it in real time. Um, and that for a younger workforce is really important. 
is to focus on the work that matters versus focusing on tasks that either can be automated or that are repeatable tasks that we um, can use software to help execute. Um, the technology piece has been crucial. All right. There are so many things that I want to touch on here that you mentioned. So trust, transparency, technology. It's interesting because as I'm listening to you, we recently hired somebody that's very experienced, 20 years in the agency industry, has worked for lots of other companies, much bigger than ours. And it's been interesting getting feedback on all the things that this person thinks we're doing really well as a small company. And as myself, who, you know, I worked in corporate America for a little while, but like, you know, we... I haven't been, I haven't run a big team for a very long time. And these are all the things that they are calling out, you know, from the trust perspective, right? Like how we handle the freedom that we give them, the amount of responsibility, it's a double-edged sword, but that's a thing that we get a lot of feedback on. I think people really appreciate, and it's a shameless plug, but one of the things that you mentioned was like how the conversation around time tracking happens. I think it's so easy for the conversation around time tracking to be really counterproductive and um, counterproductive not only to like building trust with the team, but also to the the core reason why it's done in an agency, which is more about like resource allocation and profitability and less about like actually keeping people busy. Exactly. It's, <laughs> like, and I think most agencies have been through this journey where it's like you're trying to hold your team accountable to utilization and then one day you realize that they have no control over their utilization it's actually your job to keep them highly utilized and it's like oh shit like why have i been putting all this pressure on my team to do this so that's huge and i'll put some links in the show notes on how to think about the time tracking conversation right because i think that's such a common thread where people go wrong on the trust side and then they create this sense for their team that they're being watched and you know they have to lie about where their time's going and it's just all very very destructive and then on the transparency side to your point being able to have conversations about what's happening in the business without having to go all the way to full open book management which is like a massive educational lift like most people do not know how to read a PL, um, and most people don't have the context to be able to see a part of it and then rationalize like the broader context and i think that that's talked about as the way to be transparent but i think that if you understand the numbers well you can pull back and introduce just enough uh, context the team without having to go all the way. So I'll leave some resources in the show notes about that as well. But that's another thing that this new employee that we hired has given us really great feedback on is they feel uh, really empowered to be able to help out with these things that are really important to the business to understand what's going on. And to your point, it feels like we're all sitting on the same side of the table and we're all kind of solving these challenges together. Um, and it can be a really empowering thing. And I also find that it weeds out weak, uh, I don't want to say weak, but there's certain people who are going to run from those problems. And there's certain people who are going to run to those problems and want to help. And of course, I want the people that run to those problems on my team, because that's what we do. We solve problems uh, as an agency. And so I think that that's also like a powerful magnet in a sense that it will attract and keep the people who want to be working on these kinds of things. And it will hopefully weed out some of the folks that are not uh, maybe uh, comfortable with the risk uh, and just the nature of working in client mm -hmm. services and the ebbs and flows that tend to come with that. Um, so those are yeah. some powerful things. And something that we do with new managers, which has been really helpful, is we have a presentation. It's literally Chris called Agency Math. Um, and it's not our real numbers. It's just, you know, for its whole easy numbers. But you, know, you think about new managers who just literally haven't had much exposure to the business world mm. is that's been really helpful to walk them through through the fundamentals of uh, revenue versus expenses and profit and margin um, and give them sort of a real world math example of how that works. Because we've all been there. I mean, I remember when I was 23 years old, I worked at Fleischman Hillard in the John Hancock building in Chicago. And, you know, here I am, I'm, you know, I catch wind that we have a client that pays us, you know, 10 million bucks a year. And I'm like, like if they're paying us $10 million a year, how come I'm only making $34,000 a year? This is bullshit. You know, sitting in the John Hancock building with 300 employees, right? You just have no like concept of how the agency math works. Yeah. And so we thought it was really important for our new, any new manager to walk, to have that presentation and walk through that with them. So they at least can get their heads wrapped around uh, the financials of, of an agency. Um, and be able to I think, or even you know, rationalize it a little bit more because I know we've all been there. I've been there. Yeah. 
I want to close on, you know, just as a, a very experienced, seasoned uh, entrepreneur that's built an agency, built several companies now and reached, you know, some impressive scale and gone through a very quick growth spurt and transitioned through one of the hardest transitions, in my opinion, mm-hmm. in scaling an agency. Looking back, uh, what advice would you give to yourself and to others that might be where you were um, earlier on in your agency, agency career about how to get to where you are today faster or perhaps with fewer headaches? Yeah. Uh, focus on people over profit because it doesn't work in reverse. Um, I can't stress that enough. You know, we, we are in a services business. Um, we work in teams. And so if, if what you're worried about is profit, um, everything else will suffer. And I, and I want to qualify that by saying you can't only run your business to the people. Um, you certainly need to be running your business to the numbers. Um, but focusing on your people first and wrapping your arms around them, uh, opening up your ears and listening to them, providing them resources in the space um, and the safe place for them to show up to work as, them tr- as their true selves um, that has been the key that has really worked for us. Um, the reality is any of us, we could all go out and we could quadruple our revenue. Revenue is not the problem. What happens when you scale your revenue, um, and with disregard to your people is number one, you have, you lose your culture. You have no culture champions because now you have so many new people. There's no one who's championing all of that, you know, culture that you've cultivated. You lose your culture And then the second thing that goes really quickly is your reputation. So your quality service reputation, which takes you years and years and years to build and like a year to completely flush it down the toilet because you lack the training and processes, the processes that worked when you were 10 people or 20 people sure as hell don't work when you're 50, 60, 100 people. Um, So I would every day, every founder focus on your people over profit. Um, because if you do that, the profit will follow and it does not work in reverse. Sage advice. It reminds me of something I heard. You build the people and the people build the business. Um, yes. I think that rings true here. Yes. That's better. I'm going to use that next time. <laughs> I like it. And for those listening, I mean, hopefully you've listened to enough episodes to know that in my opinion, doing things that benefit people in your agency are the same things that lead to profitability. Um, and I'm sure Lindsay, you've had this experience where like the better you can get at scoping client work and resource planning and planning for balance, planning for people to not work over time. Like those are all the things you need to do to be profitable and build scalable operations and, you know, have a lot of people on your team. And they're also super important ways in which you can grow without creating a lot of the, um, <laughs> the the fallout that I see a lot of agencies experience when, yeah, they grow their revenue very, very quickly. They just start throwing more people at it and the whole thing kind of turns into a dumpster fire. Um, it's not a very pretty sight. So I, I think that those two things, to your point, can live in homeostasis. And historically, I think they've people have believed that profitability and people are at tension with one another in an agency, but they really don't have to be. At least that's right. my perspective. Right. You can balance high care with high performance. It is possible. Not easy, but possible. Uh, (laughs) Lindsay, I appreciate all of your insight and you taking the time. For those that want to follow you and learn more about what you're up to, where should they find you on the internet? I am all over the internet and all the places that you would think to find me. So you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, You're welcome to email me directly. I'm just Lindsay with an EY at blastmedia.com. And Marcel, I really appreciate the conversation. I appreciate you being here. We'll leave links to all of the resources that were mentioned in the show notes, as well as Lindsay's contact information. And with that, thank you for tuning in and listening. Leave us a comment wherever you're listening to this and let us know what you learned. And Lindsay, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it.